So, let us move on to query optimization. Uh, this chapter actually has a lot of material, but I am going to not cover most of it. Uh, even when I teach my course here, uh, I tend not to have too much time for query optimization and I am not able to cover the whole chapter. Uh, but in this short course, I am afraid I have to uh, you know make it even more brief. So, the uh, key point of query optimization is that there are many different ways of evaluating a query. You might specify the query uh, in some way in SQL, there are many different ways in SQL. And even if there is only one way in SQL, that one way in SQL may have many different ways of being expressed in relational algebra. And the many different ways in relational algebra can be implemented using many different algorithms, merge join, hash join, index nested loop join, which leads to a very large number of alternative plans, which will all give you the same result. You could use any one of them. And how do you choose between them? Well, you want to choose the lowest cost plan amongst all of those. And how do you find the cost? You have to have cost estimation. So, that is what the query optimizer is all about. So, first uh, let us start with uh, this plan. It is doing a natural join of instructor teacher scores um, and then select department name equal to music and project on name title. Um, this particular query uh, is actually uh, uh, you know does not do exactly what you might think it does because course dot department is equated to instructor dot department. We had discussed this query as a pitfall for natural joins. Uh, so, uh, somehow this uh, slide uh, came with a buggy version of the uh, particular plan which has that bug, but it is ok. Let us pretend that we are only interested in instructors who belong to the same department as the course, then this query is correct with that formulation. So, anyway coming back, um, what we had was a select on top of this join. If we compute this whole join, we are joining the entire teachers relation with the course relation, these are pretty big and then join that with the instructor relation which is also pretty big. And then we are restricting it to department equal to music. So, what we have done is we have computed information for all departments and then we throw everything out except music. It is probably not a very good plan. Now, here is an alternative plan. Um, I push the selection on department name equal to music down on instructor. And so, I am only going to consider, consider instructors in the music department. How about on this side, I am going to do the join of all of teachers and course and then join that. So, this is a better plan because it at least reduces the number of instructors that I am joining, but you can do better. I could have even pushed the department name selection, uh, which will apply to both course and instructor. I could have pushed it down on course also and reduce this further. So, this business of taking a query like this with some selection and transforming it to an alternative form, um, in this case a selection got pushed down. There are many other transformations possible which guarantee the same result, but the cost may be widely different. So, here is another uh, version of this, which is the same as the second plan before, but early in, in the last plan, we just had the operators without saying how they are evaluated. This is called a logical query plan, logical in the sense we are not spinning down the physical details, logically this is what we want to do. This on the other hand is an evaluation plan and this spins down uh, the details of how we are doing each of these steps. Uh, so, in this case, uh, we had uh, pushed the selection down an instructor uh, and we decided to do a merge join here. So, we add a sort operator here and here to sort the inputs. Um, now, teachers join course again we had to join it. So, we chose hash join in that case. And we also had pushed a projection on course, on course ID title. Uh, this by the way, um, yeah, so uh, this is not the same query. It looks similar, uh, but this is the corrected version of the query where we eliminated the department name here. We did not want it. Um, we, so, this version actually computes the full, uh, you know, instructors who teach courses in other departments are also considered here. So, this project has been pushed down. So, we have annotated uh, this whole thing with saying tuples are pipelined from the project to this hash join and from this sort they are pipelined into merge join 
from this sort their pipeline into merge join. Now, sort itself is really two operators, uh, which is uh, the run generation and the merge. So, really you should think of this as two parts. Uh, over here, we use index 1, that is the name of the index, uh, to find instructors in the music department. And we are pipelining those results to the sort, actually to the run generation part of sort. Uh, the run generation will complete and only then pass tuples on to the uh, merge part of uh, merge phase of sort. The merge phase output is pipeline straight to the merge join. Similarly, here the merge phase output is pipeline also to the same merge join. Uh, now, this project in turn does the sort to remove duplicates. Um, here, the sorting was on ID, that is not useful for name title. So, we will need one more sort to do that. I have not shown the details. So, that is a complete query evaluation plan. So the, uh, there are several things here, but before we get into it, for today afternoon's lab, uh, you would be looking at query plans. So, as I told you earlier, you just prefix the query with explain to see what plan is chosen. How exactly to do this depends on the database you are using. For example, in SQL Server, you can say set show plan underscore text on. After this, any query which is submitted will not execute the query, instead it will show the plan. And then set show plan text off will stop that behavior. Other Oracle has its own syntax for explain and so forth. Okay. So, now uh, let us see how a query optimizer works. Uh, so, the steps are shown here, um, the steps in cost based query optimization. Now, many systems earlier did not do full cost based optimizer they used what are called heuristic optimizers. What that means is they did not necessarily have a cost model. They would have heuristics which say that in general, if you can do a selection before you do the join, do it first. Do not postpone the selection to after the join. Uh, and some of these heuristics generally work, but there are other things which may or may not reduce the cost. And do you use do that or not? Well, it is not clear. That is where cost based optimization comes in. You need to estimate cost to make the choice. So, now cost based optimization works conceptually as follows generate logically equivalent expressions using equivalence rules, and we are going to see these rules. Annotate them to get alternative query plans, and then choose the cheapest plan based on estimated cost. In reality, it does not quite work in this sequence because the number of plans is very large. So, you do not want to consider every possible plan. So, there are ways to avoid this and still get the best plan and we will see it coming up. So, the plan cost estimation is based on a number of statistical values, number of tuples, number of distinct values, histograms and so forth. For input relations, these are pre-computed and stored. So, it is possible in PostgreSQL to look at the statistics for a given relation. Um, I have not provided that uh, to you, um, but uh, it, the information is available. Uh, how to look at the uh, statistics relations in Postgres to find out what all statistics it has about a particular relation. But it is not only the input relations for which you need statistics. If you have a three way join, the first join gives some result, I need its statistics how many tuples it has, how many distinct values it has, and so forth to estimate the cost of the next join. So, we need a way to estimate statistics for intermediate results. So, again uh, there are techniques for doing this. Uh, due to lack of time, I would not be able to cover uh, this part, how to do the statistics for intermediate expressions. Uh, again, it is there in this chapter 13 of the book and in the slides, in the detailed slides. Uh, so, I will leave it out from here. Um, I am just going to look at the basic intuition of query optimization. Once you have the statistics, the cost formulae which we saw earlier can be used. In the cost formulae we used were a little simplistic. Uh, real optimizers use more detailed statistics and uh, more precise cost estimations, including CPU costs and so forth. So, let us look at the first step generating equivalent expressions. Uh, uh, and just summarize what it said, uh, you do not need to read it. So, basically two expressions are equivalent if they generate the same multi set of tuples. For SQL it is a multi set. 
and then SQL the number of duplicates matters. So, if there are two expressions which generate different numbers of duplicates then they are not equivalent. So, that is what we are going to focus on and all the equivalence rules here work with the multi set version also. So, let us look at some of the equivalence rules. The first equivalence rule says that select theta 1 and theta 2 and e is the same as first applying one of the conditions say theta 2 on that result applying the second condition theta 1. I think this should be evident that if you have a condition uh, which is a conjunction A and B, you can check A and then you can check B or you can check B and then you can check A. So, that is straightforward and you can flip it. Uh, so, that is the commutativity theta 1 theta 2 in this order can be flipped to theta 2 theta 1 that is this other order. So, first this one first applies theta 1 then theta 2, this one first applies theta 2 then theta 1. Uh, note that all these thetas are specific selection conditions like r dot a equal to s dot b is a join condition, but that could also be applied here r dot a equal to 5 is a simple selection condition that could be here. The next rule is very simple, we have a sequence of projection operation which remove uh, attributes one after another, I can collapse them into one single thing which is the last one because it, it, assuming this syntactically correct. Uh, L2 must be a superset of L1 and so forth. So, I can directly project on L1. This is kind of trivial, we will skip it. The next two are very useful rules. Uh, the first rule says that if you have a select on top of a cross product, that is equivalent to a join, a theta join. Now, why is this important? If you look at the SQL syntax of the simplest syntax in SQL you will say select something from r 1 comma r 2 where some condition that r 1 comma r 2 is turned into a cross product. Now, if I actually compute the cross product it could be very very large, but if I push the where clause con join condition in it turns into a join condition and now I can do this more efficiently. So, this transformation is very important for a SQL query. The next is a variant of that it says if there is already a condition and there is one more join condition here, I can push it in here and do a join with two conditions theta 1 and theta 2. So, the select condition here was pushed in here. So, this can be also very useful. The next uh, set of rules is about the equivalence of different join orders. Now, when we wrote the SQL query we just listed them r 1, r 2, r 3, we did not care about in what order we wrote them right. So, implicitly uh, we are saying that the order in which we write these things is irrelevant. That intuition corresponds to uh, these set of equivalence rules uh, based on uh, there are two rules commutativity and associativity. The first rule says that if I have an expression E 1 join with an expression E 2, I can flip it E 2 join with E 1 is really the same thing. Uh, by the way, I should stress on this, I am using the notation E 1, E 2, E 3 here. By that I mean E 1, E 2, E 3 can be any expression, could be a complex expression, I do not care, it could be a relation, that is ok. But this equivalence rule holds regardless of what this expression is and what this expression is. This equivalence will hold, if I flip it, the result will still be the same. Well, technically the order of attributes will get changed, uh, you have to deal with that. Um, so, some reordering of attributes may have to be done, uh, but we will ignore those details here. So, that is commutativity. <coughs> Associativity says basically this, this is again for natural joins, then the theta join version of it, slightly more complex. Natural join associativity says the following, if I take E 1 join E 2 and then join it with E 3 that is really the same as first joining E 2 E 3 and then joining with E 1. So, doing this two first and then this one is the same as doing these two first and then this one ok. So, let me show a picture for this to make stress this again that that rule which we just saw says E 1 join E 2 then join with E 3 is the same as first joining E 2 E 3 and then joining with E 1. So, that is 
join associativity, a natural join associativity. So, commutativity, th this is uh, commutativity, E1, E2 uh, turn into E2, E1. It turns out that commutativity plus associativity, this pair is equivalent, is enough to show that the join order is for inner joins is irrelevant. Now, it turns out that associativity does not work for outer joins and nor does commutativity. Uh, so, the join order is actually important for outer joins. You cannot say it in any order you want, but for regular inner joins, uh, the join order is irrelevant because commutativity and associativity hold. This last part says, how do you extend associativity for theta joins with conditions? <coughs> uh, essentially, we have to decide where to place each condition. Uh, for lack of time, I am going to skip that detail. Uh, the basic intuition, I will give you the intuition. Um, the intuition is that uh, when I join E2, E3, I can only apply those parts of this condition that involve attributes from E2 and E3. Then when I join E1 with this thing, I can apply all the remaining conditions. So, here what happened is, um, I had a join condition between E1 join E2 with E3. Some of these join conditions involved E2, some of them involved E1. So, those which involve E2 can be done here, those which involve E1 namely theta 3 have to be done later here in the final join. So, that is the only minor difference. Uh, this next rule is also very, very important for query optimization. What this rule says is, if I have a selection on top of a join, where the selection condition theta 0 involves only the attributes of one of the expression, let us say E 1 being joined. What this equivalence rule says is, if the selection were above, I can push it down into E 1 and do the selection on E 1 before doing the join. Okay, this is very important. If you go back to the query we saw some time back, okay, here I had done the selection later on, but that means that I am generating results for many other departments which I do not care about. And what I did is I pushed the selection on to instructor, so I restrict instructor to only instructors from department name equal to music. So, that is the effect of this particular rule, which is called pushing selections through joins. There is a small variant of the rule, which says that if the selection has two conditions, which are anded together, one of them is on E 1, one of them is on E 2, then I can push part of it into E 1 and part of it to E 2. So, these are the most important ones, commutativity, associativity, pushing selections. Uh, the others are uh, in some sense secondary. If you do this, you can handle uh, many, many queries. But of course, there are other queries which need more rules. Um, so, first of all in the book, we have more uh, things on pushing projections through joins, uh, equivalence, uh, associativity for uh, set uh, union intersection, commutativity also for these, uh, set difference is mo a little more restricted um, and then some other rules. And finally, there are a bunch of rules on aggregate, uh, so when you can push uh, selections through aggregates and so forth. Again, uh, some of those are in book exercises uh, and then there are others, many others which we did not have space to cover. So, uh, bottom line is there are many uh, equivalence rules which we can use to generate equivalent expressions. Uh, so, what you might do is take an expression and apply multiple rules to get a new expression. So, this one shows the result after pushing the selection on music uh, department equal to music into instructor and year equal to 2009 into teachers. So, first it got pushed here and this got pushed here. Furthermore, if you see the join order is different. Here teachers join course is first, on this side instructor join teachers is first. So, we have also done join associativity. So, we have done many things and this is a more efficient thing because we are only looking at music teachers with courses in 2009, uh, courses taught in 2009 and then looking joining with courses. But of course, the big question is in what order do we do this and how many alternatives do we generate? If we naively apply these transformation rules, it blows up in our face. 
there is a huge number of possible expressions you could create. It is enormous, you know it is like uh, even with uh, 10 relations you are looking at uh, tens of millions of alternatives, it is huge. Okay. So, we really cannot generate all the alternatives, there has to be a better way and we will briefly see some of the better ways. Um, so, uh, I think in the interest of time I will not actually run this quiz, but I will just explain the quiz question anyway. So, the question is the expression sigma r dot a equal to 5 on r join s is equivalent to which of these expressions given these two schemas. I will let you read this for a second and then I will answer the question. Okay. If you have read the question, now let me explain it. Uh, the thing here is a select on top of a join. We can push the selection onto one of the relations. In this case, the selection is on r dot a equal to 5. So, the correct answer is the first one. We have uh, done the selection on r dot a equal to 5 on r and then we join with s. So, this is the correct answer. This one is doing r dot a equal to 5 on s which is syntactically meaningless and the other answers are not meaningful. Okay. So, now let us come to uh, the issue of join ordering. So, uh, if you have relations r 1, r 2, r 3, uh, join associativity says that if I have this particular order, it is equivalent to this particular order but it is actually possible to get even more orders. For example, if I apply commutativity first here, I will flip these two, I will get R 2 join R 1. Now, if I apply associativity, I get R 2 join with R 1 join R 3, that is yet another plan. So, there are many such plans. It turns out that the sizes of these things could vary wildly and the costs correspondingly could also vary very uh, wildly. So, for example, it may be that R 2 join R 3 is very large, but R 1 join R 2 is small. Uh, so, maybe R 1 is a very small relation, R 2 and R 3 are very large. Why would R 1 be small? Maybe originally it is a small relation or maybe R 1 is really a select on a relation and the selection condition makes it very small, maybe just one tuple. In which case, it makes sense to first join R 1 with R 2, which might give us a small result and then join that small result with R 3, which also gives a small result. And maybe index nested loop join would work nicely here, it would be a very efficient plan. Whereas, R 2 and R 3 are big relations, <coughs> joining them first would take a lot of time and then almost all the results of the join are discarded in the next join. So, there is another uh, example, which I will, um, yeah. So, this shows the previous one which uh, had uh, select department name equal to music on instructor joins teachers join course. So, if we did teachers join course first, we would uh, come up with a lot of tuples because every teachers tuple is matched with its corresponding course tuple that could be pretty large. Whereas, very few teachers are in the music department, uh, but if we first do instructor uh, in the music department that is a small result and then I can join that with teachers that is a small result, then join that with course that is also a small result. So, now what I have shown you is that there are many alternative plans which can have very different costs. How do you find the cheapest plan amongst all of these? So, there are two broad approaches. One is the equivalence rules which we just saw can be used as is. But if you do it in a naive way, it would be very, very expensive. So, there are optimizers which have come up with a very nice way of applying these, which can keep the cost relatively small. It is still not cheap, it is still exponential cost, exponential in terms of the number of relations uh, and operations which are there in the query. It is not cheap, but it is not as bad as if we actually use the rules naively and generate every possible plan. Uh, remember, I, we discussed this in the context of Armstrong's axiom. We said there are lots of axioms, uh, you know, well, there are three axioms, Armstrong's axioms. You could apply them on a uh, set of functional dependencies and infer more and more, and you infer a very large number. 
but we do not really want to infer all of them. Do I really want to generate all the plans? No, my end goal is to find the cheapest plan. If there is a way to avoid generating some of the plans, while I still guarantee I will generate the cheapest plan, that is what I should do. I do not want to see all the plans, I just want the cheapest among them. And there are many uh, tricks to doing this, um, which are all part of uh, this. There is an optimizer which was called Volcano, uh, which was uh, developed uh, in around 1992 uh, time frame. And that optimizer showed how to use transformation rules and efficiently find the best plan. So, that was a huge step forward. And subsequently, the person who developed it, Goods uh, Grafer, he uh, went on and implemented it. It is now part of several commercial database systems, including Microsoft SQL Server. The other approach is much older. It dates back to the very first uh, relational database prototype called the System R algorithm. So, instead of doing uh, transformation based optimization, System R said, I primarily care about join order. Well, I also care about selections. Uh, so, I am going to handle selections heuristically by doing them as early as possible. In other words, I will push selections down to the lowest level possible and then I will pick the join order after doing this. And for other operations such as aggregates, they had some heuristics. We are not going to consider that. But this is actually a huge step forward. This was a landmark result because before this, there was no efficient way of finding the best plan, even considering just join orders and selection pushing. You know, this, this was actually enough for most queries. Uh, Volcano came in when there was a need felt for much more complex queries. For all this uh, simpler queries which were used in the earlier era, this is more than enough. It performed wonderfully. And this was a really a landmark paper. The paper which described the system R optimizer was key to the success of relational databases. Uh, so, of course, that paper also had to talk of how to find the best join order and how to do cost estimation. So, again, I am going to skip details of cost estimation and um, focus on finding the best join order. So, it turns out uh, the best join order, uh, there are many, many join orders. So, how many join orders are there? Uh, that is a function to calculate it. I will not get into the details. But with n equal to 7, there are already uh, close to a million uh, orders. With n equal to 10, it balloons to uh, not millions, but billions, 176 billion, if you actually generate all of them. It turns out it is a complete waste of time to generate all of them. Uh, in fact, uh, we can do this in time uh, proportional to 2 power n or 3 power n. Uh, what is 2 power n with n equal to 10? It is 1000. 3 power n. Uh, I do not remember the exact number, but it is not all that big. It's, it is definitely significantly more than uh, 1000, uh, but it is quite tolerable. It is very practical. So, the idea is to use dynamic programming. So, what we do is, if we take any subset R1, R2, Rn, the idea is that the best join order for this subset is going to be computed once and stored. And it may be used many times when I am finding the best join order of some superset of this. So, let me uh, show this intuitively and then I will give you a pseudo code for it. So, if I want to find the best join order for a set of n relations, first consider uh, all ways to break this up into two sets S1 and S minus S1 where S1 is any non-empty subset. There is also a bug in this slide. Any non-empty subset which is not equal to S. It is non-empty strict subset, I should have said, strict subset of S. So, I can break this up in different ways. Now, I will recursively compute the best order for S1 and the best order for S1, S minus S1. What do I mean by best order? Again, I am going to, um, you know, depending on the join order, there is also issue of what is the best join algorithm. I am uh, kind of skipping those details, but it is part of the pseudocode coming up. So, taking into account the best join algorithm, uh, what is the best order uh, for S1 and for the remaining thing. Now, at this node for a set S, there are actually 
2 power n minus 2 alternatives. That is a lot of different alternatives. Uh, so, I will recursively compute the cost for each alternative and um, find the cheapest here. But the key thing to note is that uh, if I uh, am called with a particular set S1, of course, uh, or a particular set S here, I have to do a lot of work to recursively compute this. But the key thing to note is that find best plan of S is going to be called many, many times. How many times is it going to be called? It is going to be called once per superset of S. For every superset of S, you know, that superset will be broken into S and something else. Uh, so, it is going to be called potentially many, many times. How many supersets are there for a given set? It's exponential. So, it would have been called a huge number of times, but the key to dynamic programming is to say compute it once and if it is required in future, look it up. It does not have to be computed over and over again. That is the key idea. With that key idea in mind, let us show a recursive procedure for finding the best plan for a given set S. So, the first step is to see if best plan S dot cost has been computed already. It is going to be infinity if it has not been computed. That is the data structure I have. If it has been computed already, I just return it. I do not have to do any more work. If not, I have to do some work. First of all, if S is just one relation, that is straightforward. Find the uh, set the best plan S dot plan and best plan S dot cost based on the best way of accessing S using selections on S and indices on S. So, I have some selection conditions. If an index is appropriate, I will use it. Otherwise, it is a file scan uh, on that relation. Whichever is the cheapest, I will find its cost and set best plan S dot cost and best plan S dot plan. I will save that. Otherwise, if it has more than one relation, two or more relations, I will find for each non-empty subset S1 of S such that S1 not equal to S. This is the same thing as before. Uh, find best plan of S1 recursively and recursively find best plan of S minus S1. Now, find the best algorithm for joining uh, the results of P1 and P2. And the cost is the P1 dot cost plus p2 dot cost. What are p1 and p2? These are plans, execution plans. So, I will add the cost of p1, the cost of p2 and the cost of the best algorithm for joining these and that is the cost of this way of breaking it up. So, now I am looking at many alternative ways of breaking up S into S1 and S minus S1. So, uh, if the cost which I have just found is less than best plan S dot cost, initially that would be infinite. When I find one plan for it, that cost would be less than infinite. So, I will follow this step. I will set best plan S dot cost equal to this cost and the plan itself is execute P 1's plan, execute P 2's plan and then join result. Well, actually it would not be text. It will be a tree which says join of left child P 1, right child P 2, left child is P 1 dot plan, right child is P 2 dot plan. I have just shown it like this textually. So, looping over all the alternative ways of breaking up S, there will be many alternatives. For each one, I find the cost. This if condition keeps track of the minimum cost amongst all the alternatives and at the end, I have saved up the minimum cost, I can just return it. There is a technical detail to allow index nested loops join on plans that also have uh, on relations that also have selections. Um, if you are interested, go read the book. So, that is it for join order optimization. Uh, there are many more details. It is not really true that that is it. It turns out the order in which the output is generated also matters a lot. I have skipped that detail uh, and the book has details of uh, the sort order. It, the sort order can have an impact on join algorithms later on. If the result is sorted on the join attribute, a join is super cheap. If not, join may be more expensive. So, taking that into account, the algorithm can be modified. Details are in the book. I think this is a good point to take a few questions. So, let us go back to live and take questions. Then I will come back and wrap up this chapter with a few other. Congo uh, Engineering College, Tamil Nadu, please go ahead. 
sir how how to scale the database sir how to scale a database okay so first let me explain what it means to scale a database uh, so supposing you have a business uh, which has a certain number of customers today as your business grows you want your database to handle your increasing customers increasing sales uh, increasing employees uh, and so forth if you are a website uh, scaling is even more important because uh, when facebook launched you know it was uh, used only in harvard okay so it had a few hundred people then a few thousand people then it spread to multiple universities tens of thousands hundreds of thousands then it went to millions tens hundreds of millions and now it's like around a billion now in this period the scale of operations has expanded tremendously you know when facebook initially launched you could probably just run it on one uh, small mysql database running on one machine not a problem but clearly today that is clearly absolutely impossible it has to run on a large number of servers running on parallel so scaling uh, the system means how do you design it such that if the uh, if the needs grow if more and more users join we should be able to add more machines and uh, handle the increased load by hand having more machines of course we should also optimize the code such that you know it doesn't use resources recklessly it's careful about using resources but after this has been done the only way to scale is parallel so there are two parts uh, generally we focus on scaling an application uh, and then there's an another issue of scaling a parallel database so one way to handle it is to have a parallel database which can take many uh, queries in parallel and that database itself should be scalable we'll talk a little bit about this in the context of big data uh, but there's a lot of interest in this area scalable data storage systems scalable databases where uh, you can keep adding machines a few at a time and uh, migrate some of the load on to the new machines and thereby keep growing as uh, your needs grow you can add more and more machines and grow with it uh, and the key thing is you don't have to shut down the database in the midst of all this growth there's a older generation of parallel databases uh, which didn't allow this kind they allow, they were scalable but they would require a brief shutdown when you added new machines that is a complete no no in today's uh, web uh, era where you can't bring down facebook in order to add a few machines facebook has to keep running even as i add more and more machines so today's parallel uh, systems used for such applications uh, are scalable and uh, they can be scaled dynamically without shutting down uh, does that answer your question okay sir sir i have another one question okay is it possible to get the deleted tuples from the table after commit okay the question is, is there after any other you way? run a transaction that deletes tuples and it commits can you get the deleted tuples uh, by and large the answer is no but specific databases have some features which can help you undo mistakes so oracle for example when you delete tuples from a relation it gets stored in uh, some other area they don't actually delete it immediately they will collect it later if the database is running out of space uh, it will uh, th those deleted tuples will be garbage collected later on but if immediately after the delete you realize you made a mistake it's possible to go back and get the deleted tuples the way you access it is oracle specific uh, but not all databases support it i don't think postgresql supports that any other question okay sir thank you okay before we take another live question there is a nice question on chat which says which type of index is appropriate to this situation the situation is in board exams assume that uh, some uh, 2 lakh records are there which is conservative if you look at all the boards across india it's much bigger the number of people who take uh, je is uh, je main would i don't know the numbers this year but it will be well over million several uh, it was a million a few years ago uh, i don't know what it is now but it must be much more uh, so now when the result is announced each student will try to search his or her result what kind of index is effective uh, that's a good question uh, i'll give a two part answer to this first of all uh, any index which has to go to disk is going to be extremely slow when 2 lakh people are accessing the data 
uh, if you require a disk access uh, per record here, you are dead. But the good news is 2 lakhs is not a large number. It may seem like a large number, but 2 lakh records with all their marks and so on. How many bytes do you need per record? 100 bytes? 2 lakhs is 200,000. 100 bytes is uh, what? 20 million bytes. That is nothing. So, the first step is you keep everything in memory. That is the best thing to do. Do not even uh, go to the database. And uh, so, you can completely avoid the overheads of going to a database by doing the following. First, read all the results into memory and build an in-memory hash index on that. And you can do this in Java by just using a standard hash map. That is a built-in uh, data structure in Java. Use it. And now, everything is in memory. So, when a candidate comes with a lookup, uh, looking up their roll number, you just look up the roll number, retrieve the data which you have already retrieved from the database and stored in memory, return it. This is by far the most efficient way, bypass SQL. This is exactly what we did for gate results. Gate also has something like a million people are taking the exam currently, and uh, we wanted to be able to support this load. Uh, we did this some years ago when the load was 300,000 or so, it was not a million. Uh, and uh, we just did this and we stress tested this and we showed that within one hour we could handle the entire load of 300,000 people all coming in one hour. Uh, so, the best way was to bypass the database. Uh, so, that is the answer to your question, do not use the database, preload your results into your application and use that. And the good thing is now scalability is also very trivial. Supposing uh, my uh, machine can handle maybe not 3 lakh, maybe 1 lakh. I just set up 10 machines, okay, and now I can handle uh, 100,000 uh, on each server. Each server has its own copy of the results, and I can handle a million users coming in one hour without any problem. Of course, there has to be some more thing which uh, says that a request should be routed to one of these servers. There are a bunch of tricks for this. Um, so, there is uh, one of the tricks used here is that you can have 10 machines with the same IP address and the switch which runs very fast, it is not doing any query processing, the switch just routes packets. Based on the source IP, it may hash and send the packets to any one of these 10 servers. So, the load is balanced amongst these 10 servers, which is done at the level of the network switch. It is not even at the level of a web server. Even before the web server, the network switch does load balancing. And now, each of these 10 servers uh, handles one tenth of the load. And if it can handle 100,000 requests in one hour, all million can come in the first hour without seeing any problem. So, that is how you would handle such scale. Uh, this particular application was super simple because there are no updates. It is just a lookup. It is very easy to parallelize. When you have updates, there is more uh, effort required to parallelize. So, a very timely question because board results are coming out right now, and I am sure many candidates uh, in some boards are running into trouble. They cannot retrieve the results. In other boards, uh, they are able to see the results without any problem. If they took the trouble to build a system like this, they would not have a problem. I think some boards tried the tricky solution. I think CBSC said it will announce its results on Monday but they put up their results on Sunday. So, what happened is a few people somehow found out about it and then others heard from them. So, the load would slowly increase, but it would not be everybody jumping on at exactly the same time. So, that way they probably spread the load. Okay, we will take some live questions. Okay, we have Bhilai Institute of Technology. Bhilai, please go ahead. Sir, what is the difference between index, index scan and table scan and which is more effective sir? while okay. going for uh, query optimization. Okay. This I actually covered in an earlier slide. So, let me just show you the slide to answer your question. Uh, file scan or also called linear scan simply reads all the blocks of the file one after another and looks at each record and sees if it uh, matches the selection condition. So, this is a file scan. In contrast, a linear scan, uh, index scan sorry, that was the other part of the question does the following. Uh, so, the it is called an index scan, but it is actually an index lookup. So, the first step is to go down the index to find uh, the record IDs which satisfy the index condition. So, if I had an ID equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I will go down the B plus tree index 
to find the record id for records with id equal to 1 2 3 4 5 so i need an index on id attribute to do this if i don't have an index i can't do an index scan for this particular selection id equal to 1 2 3 4 5 given the index i'd go down find all the matching records for the id attribute there would be just one record if i said department name equal to comp sci there may be multiple records so depending on the case uh, i get one or more record ids now using those record ids i will fetch the uh, records from the relation this is what is a uh, index scan okay we have sitaram bhai uh, from gujarat so uh, can you please give us a small example where we can uh, understand uh, the join query easily okay so let me uh, use the whiteboard and uh, give you an example so let's say there are uh, two relations i'm abstracting away to keep it simple r a b s uh, b c i want to compute the natural join of these relations so i want to equate the b attribute here and here now supposing i have an index on s b okay so the b attribute of s has an index now i have a number of tuples in r let's say the r tuples are uh, uh, let's say 1a 2b 3a 4c 5b and so forth okay so this is the sequence of tuples in here and on s again i have multiple tuples let's say i have uh, a9 b7 uh, maybe another a4 uh, c11 uh, d21 maybe another uh, you know e31 and so forth so this is my s relation and i have an index on this so what i'm going to do is take the first tuple here from r and find the value of b so the value of the b attribute is a here so this second attribute is a and i'm going to look up the index so this is an index on this table i will go through the index to find all tuples whose all tuples in of the s relation whose b value is the given value a so i will search through the index and i will find pointers here to that and to that okay so i have gone through the index and i find two matching records with uh, the uh, first attribute b being with the value a so i will take these two i will fetch each of these and match it and output it so what do i get i'll get 1a9 and then 1a4 those are the two things which i output okay now i'll move on to the next tuple so the nested loops is on this so for each tuple in r okay that is the loop um uh, now it's an index nested loop in the sense that for the uh inner relation s here i'm using an index to find all the matching tuples and then i iterate over them so i just did it for the first tuple of r now i take the second tuple of r 2b again i use the index to find which all s tuples have the value b for this attribute and here i find this one that's only one so this one matches that so the output i get is 2b 7 is a natural join so the b attribute appears only once and similarly i move on to 3a which again outputs uh, 3a 9 and 3a 4 and so forth so there are many uh, such results which i generate i output all of them so that is an index nested loops joiner okay balaji institute sir my question is regarding distributed query processing in that how to minimize uh, the query processing times so uh, i don't have time to get into all the details uh, but essentially uh, in distributed query processing there are extra steps for moving data around i mentioned briefly the data exchange operator uh, so you have to introduce uh, these steps um, and uh, then uh, there are extensions to the standard optimization algorithms uh, 
to take distribution into account. I don't have time to get into exactly how this is done, uh, but people have developed these things. So they will find the best overall plan, taking into account shipping of data from one site to another, and the time it takes for that shipping, the time at local sites, and so on. Uh, so uh, that's just the high level intuition. I don't have time to get into the details. If you have any follow up questions, please go ahead. Sir, when we are retrieving large data, the connection will be live because it is connection oriented. Is there any other way of retrieving data, large data without connection uh, oriented? Okay. The question is. Uh, if you are doing a result set, so this is JDBC or ODBC. If you are receiving a lot of data, uh, you may not want to hold the connection for the whole time, so you may want to close it and open it again. Um, so I don't think that this is supported by uh, JDBC drivers that I am aware of, but there is a related issue here. Uh, supposing I have a very large piece of data, a uh, blob. And my J, let's say it's one gigabyte. It's a huge blob. Supposing my JDBC driver insists on fetching that whole blob over as soon as I, uh, you know, do RS dot next, it fetches the whole thing over. It's going to fill my memory with one gigabyte of that blob, and uh, I'm going to get into trouble. I don't have enough memory to do such things. So, uh, what would be done normally is uh, for these large object types, it would not fetch the whole thing over, uh, but uh, as you, uh, you know, fetch parts of it. So, how, how do you do this in JDBC? Somebody had asked this question. Uh, so, uh, I have put this up on Moodle actually. I think I sent an email about this uh, or maybe I did not, uh, but I have put up a material on Moodle which explains how to uh, interact with, uh, you know, large objects using JDBC. So, how to store large objects on PostgreSQL, there are some non-standard things in PostgreSQL. Uh, so, how to store large objects in PostgreSQL, how to fetch them using JDBC, how to store them using JDBC. And the basic intuition is that uh, in JDBC, you have file streams, uh, input or output file streams, and you associate them with a particular uh, uh, result. So, you, when you have done a query, you can uh, do a rs dot get input stream on a particular attribute and presumably the implementation should not download the whole data, but should uh, download bits of it and then as you fetch next on the input stream, it should go back and fetch more parts of the data. Uh, so that should be how it is implemented. Uh, I think there were early implementations which did not do this, which would actually die, but I think today those problems should have been fixed and it would fetch on demand. I, and I think you can also control how much data is prefetched, uh, so that uh, you don't have too many round trips to the database. I hope that answers your question. If you have any follow-up questions, uh, go ahead and ask. Over to you. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, the next one is Prestige Institute, Indoor. Please go ahead, Prestige. So, can you guide me about the JDBC connection for the multiple database? So let me answer the, uh, maybe I misunderstood it, but the later part of the question said that you are having problems connecting to multiple databases using JDBC and how do you do that? Um, I, like I said, you should be able to open multiple connections, so you have to load all the drivers. Uh, some people had problems even loading drivers in the first place uh, because they did not follow the instructions on uh, how to set up Eclipse and uh, tell it the paths to the uh, PostgreSQL uh, uh, drivers for JDBC, similarly Oracle or whatever databases you want to connect to, you have to load all those drivers. Uh, so first you have to tell Eclipse where these reside, then you have to use uh, the driver manager dot get connection with the appropriate uh, URL. So if you are able to open one connection at a time, all of this is working. Then the remaining thing is how do you open multiple connections. So, it should just work. I mean, if that is not working, we should, uh, you know, send me details or post it. When I say send me, please do not email it to me. Please post uh, what is going on, what you did and what are the symptoms. Post it on Piazza. That is the right forum for uh, getting into these details. If something did not work, I am not sure exactly what was wrong with your settings. So, we can follow up on Piazza. 
Uh, on Piazza, the good thing is there are many people ready to answer the question. If you send it to me, I may not answer it. I don't have time right now. Okay. Uh, actually, sir, uh, we are uh, planning for the virtual e-learning. So we are planning about the virtual e-learning. For that, we are creating a data center, a one data center, in which the, all the data is to be merged. So we need a JDBC query uh, a script for connecting the, all the database to each other and then distribute it to the multiple system. Mm, okay, I think your question is slightly different then. Maybe you want one a JDBC connection where you can make a query and your system will forward it to appropriate databases, collect the answers and give it back. Uh, that's a much harder uh, problem. Uh, there are probably tools for this. Uh, building this from scratch is possible, but it will require a fair amount of work. There may be tools for this. It's not easy because each database has its own variant of SQL if you're using different databases. If your goal is to get parallelism out of this, where you submit a query to one place and that forwards the query to a number of instances of the same database uh, based on the uh, query parameters. Uh, this is essentially building your own uh, parallel database. Maybe this is what you want to do, a low cost parallel database which you build on your own. Uh, so there are uh, projects which have done this in the, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who use techniques like this. Uh, it's often called sharding meaning your data is broken up into pieces across many copies of the same database. And then your, usually what happens is, instead of a single point in between which redistributes, that becomes a bottleneck, your application will open connections to all copies of the database. And then you have a partitioning. Uh, so you say that IDs from in this range are in database uh, copy one, IDs in this other range are in the second one and so forth. So your application will uh, open connections to all the databases and then if you are querying for a particular ID, it will figure out which instance has that uh, data for that ID and send the query to that instance. Okay, so this is referred to as sharding uh, where you build your own parallel database from scratch which not, uh, it's very difficult to do joins across databases and so on. So this is only applicable in limited contexts but these limited contexts are actually pretty wide. Uh, Facebook was uh, based uh, pretty much totally on sharding um, across many MySQL, some parts of Facebook. Facebook has many things. Some major parts of Facebook were based purely on sharding for many years. I think they are using other techniques now, but this was their key technique. For that matter, Google ads were also based totally on sharding for many years. Only very recently have they moved to other technology. Uh, I don't know if that answered your question. Over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, we'll take one last question, and after that, I will wrap up the remaining parts of today's talk. Uh, this is from. Uh, so this query uh, is uh, regarding the performance uh, part of this whole uh, workshop. Uh, we have been, I have been personally observing that uh, if we take a look at the execution uh, plan of pre SQL query. Uh, and uh, especially in case of an order by class, we see half the cost of the uh, half the half of the cost is uh, just involved in just you know uh, putting up this order by class. Could we uh, one that if we uh, could you please explain a little about the internals of this uh, how this order by class internally works? One number two, should we consider it rather taking out from the SQL and putting it on the application server? And number third is uh, uh, if we could discuss a little bit about uh, scalability and uh, talk especially about the vertical and horizontal uh, partitioning of the database. Okay, okay so there are uh, several different questions. Uh, the first question was about the cost of the order by clause and that is actually part of uh, today's lab. I'm very happy to see uh, people so enthusiastic that they've already done today's lab and are asking questions even before the lab. Fantastic. This is exactly uh, what I'm hoping many people will do. So to answer your question, uh, the question was that the cost of the order by clause is half the cost of queries for some of the queries which were uh, which uh, you tried. Uh, so I don't know exactly what the queries were, uh, but uh, this is not surprising. So uh, order by clause is implemented by sorting. Sorting is not cheap. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that uh, you know SQL uh, does not provide any default ordering. Moreover, 
sorting was the primary way of removing duplicates. Since sorting is expensive, uh, SQL uh, decided not to remove duplicates unless you ask for it explicitly. Otherwise, every query would be spending its time removing duplicates uh, when maybe it was not required. So it's not surprising that sorting is a major part of the cost of your plan. Uh, it depends on the query itself. If your uh, query is, uh, you know, has uh, joins, uh, you know, then the join cost may be comparable to the uh, sorting cost. Uh, now the next part of the question was, given that this cost is high, why don't we do it in the application rather than in the database? Uh, that's a very bad idea. Uh, database sorting is very highly optimized. It's very good at it. Uh, so if its cost is expensive, uh, if, if you see the plan cost, that's not a actual, you know, it's not saying it's so many seconds. It's some unit which it uses internally. So it may be a large part of its cost, but usually the actual time for sorting is not that high. It's pretty small. And if you were to do the sorting in your own application, you would probably uh, be doing it slower than the database does. Uh, so don't do it in your application, leave it to the database. It's not worth it doing it in your application. Uh, the last part of the question was, uh, it's actually a different question. It said, uh, say something about scalability with horizontal and vertical partitioning. Uh, so, uh, I actually answered this last part of the question uh, as an answer to just the previous question. Uh, so, we said uh, partition the user IDs across different copies of the same database. Uh, so, that is called sharding in the uh, industry. However, in the research community, this is what is called horizontal partitioning. What we mean is, uh, we have a number of rows of some relations. And we are partitioning the relation, throwing some of those rows in one of the uh, database cop instances, some of the rows in another, and so forth. So let me show a figure to illustrate this. Let's open the whiteboard. So if I had a large relation like this with many rows, horizontal partitioning basically says some of those rows goes to uh, db, uh, sorry, db uh, copy 1, then some others go to, uh, sorry, I am writing b first for some reason, copy 2 and so on. So I am uh, breaking up the relation into pieces, this is called horizontal partition. It's also known as sharding in the industry. This is this term came much later. Horizontal partitioning is a much older word, which has been around for decades now. So uh, this is used very widely for uh, parallelizing database access, uh, especially build it your own parallel database, meaning that you divide up your data across a number of uh, instances of a database, and then you query the appropriate instances uh, when you want to retrieve data. Uh, this is very nice when you just want to store retrieve data based on some attribute, user ID, let's say. But if you want to do a join between data which is on these two copies, you have to write your own join code. There is no way to do it automatically. So the, uh, you know, initially uh, people built their own. Now other people realized that people are doing this and said, let's build our own parallel database system which underneath has many copies of uh, MySQL or PostgreSQL. So interestingly, one of the people who tried to do this was Professor Fatak, uh, about I think eight or to ten years ago. Uh, it, I don't remember the exact time frame. Ma many years ago, uh, he started this project to build a parallel database running on top of many copies of PostgreSQL. Uh, it was a very good idea, but he didn't have enough uh, people to work on it who really understood technology in depth. So I don't think that went very far. Uh, but around the same time, there were other people working on this problem. So there was a, a several companies which have done this. Uh, there is a company called Green Plum, which is now part of uh, EMC, which did this. Closer to home, there is a company called Aster Data. Uh, one of the founders of Aster Data is an alumnus of IIT Bombay. He was my student here around 2001. 
So uh, he worked on databases for his uh, BTEC thesis, went and did a PhD in databases, and then went and started, uh, co-founded this company. Uh, this company uh, was bought by uh, another parallel database company called Teradata. And he is currently, he is continuing to uh, head the Aster division of Teradata. Uh, so uh, this technology has really taken off parallel uh, databases uh, built on top of multiple copies of MySQL or PostgreSQL underneath has really taken off. So Aster and Greenplum both use PostgreSQL. In fact, there was another project uh, at Yahoo which also used PostgreSQL. It was an internal project. Uh, but at that time, they claimed they were the world's largest database at six petabytes or something like that. Uh, thousands of copies of PostgreSQL running underneath. So interestingly, the largest databases in the world today uh, run on such systems. Uh, there, uh, there are also other things which were developed at Google, which are more recent, uh, which have built their own database system from ground up. Uh, but many people found it more convenient to build it on top of existing databases. I hope that answers your question. It's a very long answer to a short question.